Infrared radiation has wavelengths that are longer than those which the human eye can see. Because of this, the unaided eye does not detect infrared radiation. The use of infrared film, which is sensitive to these wavelengths, allows familiar objects to be analyzed in a different way. This is an infrared composite photograph of the state of California taken by the Landsat satellite. Closer detail can be seen in this picture. The area at the bottom right is the city of Los Angeles. Cities and industrial areas are green or dark gray. Land covered with healthy crops, trees, and other green plants appear bright red. These areas would not be as obvious in a regular photograph. Suburban areas with sparse vegetation are light pink. Barren lands are light gray, and the Pacific Ocean is completely black. The variation in the density of vegetation is not as obvious in a regular photograph. Infrared photographs can also reveal geological features. This photograph of the San Francisco Bay Area clearly shows the San Andreas Fault running northwestward through the pine and redwood forest of the Santa Cruz Mountains and out into the sea south of San Francisco. Just as this ability to see the geological fault is a great aid to the geophysicist, the ability to use infrared radiation to distinguish between colorless compounds is a valuable aid to a chemist. Infrared spectra vary so much from one compound to another that a spectrum can be used as a fingerprint for a given compound. If the infrared spectrum of an unknown compound matches that of a known compound, it is almost conclusive proof that the compounds are identical. Some chemical companies provide infrared spectra of their compounds as evidence of the purity of the compound. In infrared spectroscopy, as in other types of spectroscopy, the energy required to excite a molecule from a lower energy level to a higher energy level is proportional to the frequency of the absorbed electromagnetic radiation. The change in energy, delta E, is equal to a constant H times the frequency nu. This fundamental law can also be expressed in terms of wavelength rather than frequency. If this is done, the change in energy, delta E, is equal to a constant H times the speed of light C divided by the wavelength of light, lambda. In infrared spectroscopy, another unit is often used. This unit, called the wave number, is represented by the symbol nu bar and is equal to the reciprocal of the wavelength in centimeters. The use of wave numbers has a distinct advantage over wavelength in that wave numbers are directly proportional to the energy absorbed. As a result, this unit is increasingly being used to report infrared data in the literature. The infrared region normally used extends from about 2.5 to 15 microns if the radiation is expressed in wavelength, or from about 4,000 to 600 reciprocal centimeters if the radiation is expressed in wave numbers. In this region, the energy absorbed leads to an increase in the vibrational energy of the molecules. A demonstration from classical physics on the behavior of springs is helpful in describing the principles of infrared spectroscopy. If a weight is attached to a spring and the weight pulled down and released, the spring begins to oscillate or vibrate up and down. Simply by counting the number of vibrations per minute, the frequency of the vibration can be obtained. For a given weight and stiffness of the spring, the frequency is constant. If the weight is pulled further down and the number of vibrations counted, it can be seen that there are still the same number of vibrations per minute. However, if two springs are attached to the support and weight, it is more difficult to pull the weight down. The vibrations can again be counted as was done before. It can be seen now that the stiffer spring system leads to a higher frequency. When a system is constructed in which the spring has the same strength as in the original system, but the weight replaced with a heavier one, the system vibrates at a lower frequency than the original system. In other words, as the stiffness of the spring increases, the frequency of the vibration increases. Also, as the mass of the weight attached to the spring increases, the frequency decreases. With this model in mind, an extrapolation can be made to the stretching vibrations of the two molecules, hydrogen chloride and deuterium chloride. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen that weighs twice as much as the most abundant isotope. Each of these molecules, HCl and DCl, has a single bond between the two atoms. 
For discussion purposes, this bond can be thought of as being similar to the spring. Because deuterium is twice as heavy as hydrogen, the DCL bond vibrates at a lower frequency than the HCL bond. As a result, the characteristic absorption of the DCL molecule is 2,145 reciprocal centimeters, while the HCL molecule absorbs at the higher frequency of 2,990 reciprocal centimeters. Similarly, if one considers the position of the carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon absorptions, it can be seen that the carbon-hydrogen bond absorbs at a much higher frequency than the carbon-carbon single bond. When single, double, and triple carbon-carbon bonds are considered, the triple bond, which is much stronger, is similar to the stiffer spring. The frequency of absorption of this bond is higher than the double bond, which is higher than the single bond. This same phenomenon can be seen in the relative frequency of absorptions of the carbonyl, C double bond O, and singly bonded CO absorptions. In general, as the bond order goes up, the strength or stiffness of the bond goes up as well. Similarly, the position of the stretching absorptions of other common bonds can be added to the chart. The carbon-oxygen single bond absorbs at a lower frequency than the characteristic CO double bond of the carbonyl group. Because there is very little difference in the sums and products of the weights of the atoms in the CH, NH, and OH bonds, these three all absorb in the same area, and there is considerable overlap in their absorption frequencies. In addition to the stretching vibrations that bonds can undergo, molecules of three or more atoms can also undergo bending vibrations. There are several kinds of bending vibrations possible, and the number increases with the increasing size of the molecule. Several of these bending vibrations are commonly seen in the infrared spectrum. They are scissoring, in which the atoms bend toward each other, rocking, wagging, and twisting. All of these bends occur at a lower frequency than the absorption of the stretching vibrations. These bending absorptions also can be added to the chart developed earlier. These spectral assignments are often divided into sections. The region from 4,000 to about 1,300 wave numbers is known as the characteristic group frequency region. The frequencies below 1,300 wave numbers are classified as being in the fingerprint region of the spectrum. Beyond the very general description of the areas of the different kinds of vibrations that has been given here, there are many detailed tables of the absorptions of different kinds of bonds in a variety of environments. With the help of these tables, one can deduce much about the structure of a compound and can often unambiguously identify the structure. A compound with the molecular formula C6H10O can serve as an example of how the infrared spectrum can be used in the characterization of the compound. For this molecular formula, there are at least 18 stable compounds. Focusing on the role of the oxygen in the compound, four functional groups are possible. The oxygen could be either an aldehyde or ketone. In either case, one would expect a carbonyl absorption in the infrared spectrum. Alternatively, the oxygen could be in an alcohol. In this case, one would expect to see a carbon-oxygen single bond absorption and also an oxygen-hydrogen absorption. Finally, if the oxygen were bonded to two carbons in an ether structure, one would see the carbon-oxygen single bond absorption, but no absorption from an oxygen-hydrogen bond. Even a cursory examination of the spectrum reveals the characteristic absorption of the carbonyl and eliminates the possibility of an alcohol or ether. From either a comparison of this spectrum with reference spectra or from a more detailed analysis of the positions of the other absorptions using the tables, the unknown compound can be identified as cyclohexanone. In order to obtain a spectrum that can be used for identification purposes, the procedures and precautions necessary in using an infrared spectrometer must be understood. Obviously, if one is to obtain a spectrum, the sample must be placed in the beam of infrared radiation of the spectrometer. However, there are not many materials that are transparent in the infrared region, and therefore few materials can be used as a support. 
One of these is common table salt, or sodium chloride. This material is fashioned in the form of a transparent plate, and the sample to be studied is placed on it. Sodium chloride will dissolve in water. Therefore, a sodium chloride plate should never come in contact with water because it will damage the surface of the plate. This includes water that may be used as a solvent or moisture that may be on your fingertips. Never touch the surface of a plate in such a manner that it may be marked or etched. A pure liquid is most commonly determined as a film between a pair of salt plates. The sample whose spectrum is to be determined is dried with an appropriate drying agent before the spectrum is taken. Then the salt plates and holder are removed from the desiccator. The dried sample is placed on one salt plate and spread in a thin film over the plate. A second plate is put on top and they are placed in the holder. Either surface tension or set screws hold the plates together. Never push the plates too tightly together or they will break. These plates do not have a great deal of mechanical strength. These plates are then placed in the sample beam. With the paper properly positioned in the spectrometer, the baseline is set to about 95% transmittance with a pen adjustment control. The scanning speed is set and the scan started. When the scan is completed, it should be checked to make sure that no absorption band reaches the edge of the chart. If any absorption band is so intense that it does reach the edge of the chart, the amount of material in the sample beam must be reduced. A new scan is then completed in order to determine the exact position of the absorption band. Before the paper is removed, it may be calibrated with absorptions from an external standard. The paper is removed and the sample plates are cleaned. The usual solvent is either carbon tetrachloride or 1-1-1-trichloroethane. Even though trichloroethane is much less toxic than carbon tetrachloride, it should still be used in a well-ventilated area and contact with the hands or skin should be avoided. The spectrum that has been obtained can now be analyzed to determine the positions of the absorbing species. From these frequencies, or wavelengths, the functional groups in the sample can be identified. With additional information, the complete structure of the sample can often be determined. The ease of obtaining infrared spectra and the wealth of information they can provide make infrared spectroscopy one of the most widely used spectroscopic tools in the chemist's lab.